Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Andy Kohler from Northwest Arkansas Pediatric Clinic. And today I am joined with two very special guests. I have Dr. Terry Payton and Dr. Joe T. Robinson. And we're gonna spend some time talking about the history of our clinic because we're having a very special uh, anniversary this year. Uh, we have just hit 40 years as a clinic. Over y'all's careers, what do you think has been, is like the biggest change that you've seen in pediatrics? The impact of vaccines mm -hmm. has, has just been tremendous. Uh, the uh, impact of uh, illness from pneumococcal disease, hemophilus influenza type B or HIV, uh, that, was, that was a big part of what we saw in the hospital in the early 80s when we were in our residency. After the pneumococcal vaccines came out, those illnesses went away. And uh, you, rotavirus vaccines made probably the biggest impact for the overall burden of illness in in our world and our patients' world and, and everywhere. When when we were training, the death rate for chickenpox was around 100 to 150 kids a year. 75, half of those were immune compromised some way they were on chemotherapy or something for, for cancer. But <clears throat> the other half were normal kids who had chickenpox. Well, once that vaccine came out, that went away. And suddenly we didn't, we didn't have that. So the vaccine story is, is a big part. One of the things that I said is that vaccines are a victim of their own success. Yeah. You know, because they've been so it's good, we don't, we don't see that anymore. As a pediatrician, there's such a difference. I'm, I've been here now 13 years. Um, there's just such a difference in how I practice now compared to what I started. So we talk about HIV, which is Haemophilus influenza B, and pneumococcus. So these are two bacteria, bacterial infections. And, you know, as, as you were saying, in the early days, these were some of the biggest causes of serious disease in children. Starting at Children's, where we train, um, and if you were in the emergency room uh, and a child, I mean, it was very common, and it's even common today still, for a child to get a 103, 104 fever, and look ill, and you feel bad, and, and you're just worried, but, with the vaccines, you don't think, oh, they have H flu meningitis, or they have pneumococcal meningitis. You can go for the most common things, the new virus. Well, the most common thing then also was actually the virus, but you couldn't promise that yes. until you've done really extensive work. And uh, so a, a child that came in the ER, I mean, it seemed like uh, down the Little Rock to Children's, if you were the ER doctor on that 12 hour shift, um, you would do three or four spinal taps. Uh, and pretty consistently, you just expected that, that you were going to be talking to parents and telling them, listen, this is, could be a serious thing, and we don't know that until we do this spinal tap. And, uh, those are not done lightly, those are not done uh, without some risk. Uh, I'll say that we all got very good at them <laughs> because it was, it was almost like walking down the hallway I mean, it just was so common the need to do that that you felt confident but you also were worried this child could be really really sick and that that basically went away with the success certainly of those two vaccines early on and, and you of course you mentioned chicken pox yeah you know, and i think one of the things that we've kind of lost after the varicella vaccine has been so effective is it there's sort of this thought that chickenpox wasn't that big of a deal. Large numbers of kids who saw chickenpox, um, you would see complication. And the encephalitis is, is directly related to the varicella, vaccine, varicella virus. Um, but the others are the complications are more infections. So you get a staph infection, you get uh, some secondary infection. Now, if, if you've got Days about the antibiotics and getting rid of abscesses and infections. And uh, the biggest risk, though, as Terry mentioned earlier, I feel like or a, a, a large risk also was we took care of a lot of kids on chemotherapy. They came in and out of our clinic. And, and it's a vaccine that not only helps protect your child and yourself, uh, it's, a, it's a community protection as well. So you, you have to think of, of beyond my child and, and think of what about classmates? What, what's that child going to be exposed to in a classroom, in a school setting, on a ball team, 
something like that. And, you know, we, we also felt like that our responsibility as, as physicians in the larger community to, to get as many kids vaccinated as possible. That you don't know if you're going to be sitting next to a child that's immunosuppressed and attending school. Or, uh, it, it, there, there's the immediate, my, my child, my patient, but then there's the greater protection of, of community and who you're around. And, and both those things are true. You know, the other vaccine preventable thing, I mean, uh, uh, everybody knows about whoop and cough and the kids get, you know, the, the DPTs at two months, four months, six months, five months, five years, whatever, and then the booster, the DTAP, 10 or 11 or 12. But uh, we had a uh, two week old up here that died of uh, whoop and cough. We, we saw all those illnesses before the advent of the vaccines. So I personal history of seeing a child, 15, I mean, they, they will require complete care for the rest of their life because they have encephalitis, which is damaging to the brain. It's not just inflamed, it's damaged, injured. And so that's preventable. And, and so, it, you look back, and yes, we had the outbreak. I think it was obviously yeah, lady six, but um, and you know, we saw lots of measles. Unfortunately, those kids did fine and they recovered. Not everyone did. And go back far enough, and again, you just see the triumph of vaccine discovery. You you mentioned kind of the the need to protect the community, um, you know, with our choices, and you know, one of the things I'm most proud of our clinic is. Um, we have this vaccine policy, and we've had it for a long time. I'll actually uh, put it in place the year before I got up here. I had all these ambitions of coming up and talking about it uh, once I joined, and then y'all had already taken care of it by the time I got here, so I appreciated that. But can y'all speak a little bit to why do we have this policy? It's both philosophical uh, and then also, I think, practical. I mean, the philosophical is uh, we've, our, if, if pediatricians have an area of expertise in addition to kids, I, I feel like it's vaccines because we have something available to us. And uh, the philosophy is these things are available. Both of us, as Terry reminded me about the hip vaccine, I mean, we have been advocates since, because all of we, all of our kids have been vaccinated. All my grandkids have been vaccinated. It's just, it's good medicine. People need to know that's where we stand. I mean, they need to know that that's uh, our feeling. We've studied it. We feel like it's best for our own families. And if it's best for our own families, it's best for our patients. And if it's best for our patients, it's best for our community. And we've just been advocates and we felt like that we needed to put it out there that um, you know, if you don't want to vaccinate your kids, we're, we're not going to make you do that but we're not going to be on the same page with you on how to take care of children, your children, our children. And so we put a policy in place that, that we'd love to take care of your kids, but if you don't trust us to manage your, your vaccines and your children's care, then you've broken a vital bond between us and you and follow our advice. We don't want one of our patients who's too young to be vaccinated to be exposed to a vaccine preventable illness in our waiting room or walking down the hallway, a one-year-old who's never been vaccinated who is in early stages of whooping cough, and then we've got a two-week-old who's in there for sniffles or something. We, we feel like it's not fair to that two-week-old to potentially unnecessarily expose them to one of those vaccine preventable illnesses. And the other thing is if parents don't trust our opinion, our recommendations about the vaccines, then our, my feeling, our feeling has been, why should you trust us about any other medical decision? If, if your child does come in and is highly febrile and looks sick, and we say, hey, I, I think we should get a chest X-ray. I think we should do a, a blood culture. We should do a blood count, but we should also do a spinal tap. Well, why should you trust my opinion about what's needed for that? Or your child may need, I think your child needs to be hospitalized or needs this, this, this. If the parent doesn't trust my, my in what I feel is an informed opinion about vaccines, why should they trust my opinion about other medical issues? And, and I would say, you know, of all the things that we do, you know, vaccination to me is 
A, the most important, but B, probably the best studied. You know, so so much of pediatrics, we rely on, you know, if, you know, experience and things like that, because a lot of times it's hard to do studies in kids. Um, and so, you know, all the things that have, you know, decades and, you know, massive positive research behind it, this is the thing that we, I feel that we've got the best evidence to support. Um, and so, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just, it's important. And I've definitely seen those families where, you know, the fact that I'm saying, this is, this is so important to me that if I can't make, I can't get you to see that, that this is the right choice, then this is probably not a good, healthy, you know, physician patient relationship. And I've definitely seen those situations that were families like, oh, you really feel that passionately about it? And yes, every single one of our kids are vaccinated. Every single one of our kids are vaccinated on time. Yeah. You know, um, we, we feel passionately about this. And I think that's helped families to be more comfortable um, in the vaccines. I can have compassion for a parent that says, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this vaccine. It's like, well, God, I understand that. But here are the studies that show that it's it's still beneficial. And, and Dr. Paul Offit again, it's just the illnesses themselves are not without side effects. So he keeps reminding us of that a lot. Is you get an illness, you get some, you get sick from these things, from these terrible things that we can prevent. Those are not without potential complications and side effects. So you, you're you're taking a risk to not vaccinate, and if you want to admit that you're taking this, this slight risk of vaccinating, yes. But it's not it's not preventing something that has no complications. You're preventing something that might have a lot. Of Yes. I mean, we saw that with the COVID vaccine. Yes, there were some young teenage men who developed myocarditis from it. But the risk of developing myocarditis from COVID was so many multiples of times higher that it made no sense to not vaccinate these kids because of this risk. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic and you get that COVID, you're going to have much higher risk for uh, for having it. So as someone who has worked with families um, in this area for, for a long time, um, you know, 2023 is, you know, it's a hard year. We've got a lot of stuff going on and, you know, it's, it's hard. It's always hard. But in, in this age that we're in now, what would be, if you give like one piece of advice for those families, what, what would you say to them as like, this is the thing that I think, you know, to work on your aspiration. I would, I would say to realize that we want to work with parents, but we also have to correct parents. Uh, sometimes they're thinking or something, if there are things that come out, let's say something like sleeping on your stomach or sleeping on your back, and you, you get information that for like today, I, I thought that's the craziest thing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, you're gonna tell me to put your child, my child, and these children, these infants on their back. No way. No. But the studies kept showing that it was important and helpful and beneficial. And you have to go to what is, is true. No. And, and that's what we, our responsibility as physicians, parents, grandparents now, as doctors, we need to be aware of what that is, what those truths are. And, and be able to help parents again without being condescending to them, but say, you know, this, I mean, that's something that is completely different from what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So you go back, okay, what were you taught yeah. that was wrong? Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really wrong at the time. We didn't have the information. We have the information now. And you go, you put your child. Right. Yeah. And so we have to be willing to change but we also have to be willing to to listen to parents and to say okay we all you as parents we're going to encourage you we as physicians we we may be wrong we were wrong 25 years ago but it's because we have your child's best interest it's not something we're trying to browbeat into you we have your child's best interest at heart, and that's what we want to do is what we need to accomplish that for healthy kids.
Perry, any, any piece of advice for the millennial family out there? All, all parents know this. Just live in the moment and enjoy your kids. They grow up so fast. Well, Terry, Joe T, I appreciate y'all so much coming out and talking with us today. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of wisdom here. And, uh, you know, I want to thank y'all so much for coming out and thank y'all for watching. And uh, that's it for today.